Welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today we have a hip symposium with world-renowned surgeon Professor Wayne Paproski and Dr. Neil Shait. Professor Paproski is a professor of orthopedics at Russia University, Chicago, and is known all over the world for his work on periprosthetic bone loss, which includes the Paproski classification used during revision hip surgery. Dr. Neil Shait is associate professor and chief of orthopedics at the hospital for the University of Pennsylvania. So without much ado, I hand it over to Professor Wayne Paproski. Over to you, Prof. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity to give this um, uh, lecture. Uh, it's probably uh, here. We, we're at uh, um, 1030 in Chicago. So would that make it 10 p.m. in India? I think there's a half hour difference. It's a, kind of a half hour time zone thing, isn't it? Yes, Prof. Yeah, okay. All right, so it's late, so hopefully I won't put you to sleep. So um, I actually, the present, I just gave a grand rounds last week at Ohio State University. So this is going to be a, one that's fresh off the press from just uh, less than a week ago. So um, let's see here. Those are my um, disclosures. Not, not really that relevant to this. That's a picture of Rush University, which I'm sure that Neil remembers. So when we look at revisions, we want to make sure we get a good evaluation of the plain films and decide if it's easy, if it's hard, or if it's something you really want to do, and come up with a good, come up with a good uh, uh, operative plan. Still, according to the Australian Joint Registry, loosening is still probably the number one reason for revision. Certainly infection, dislocation are up there, but we're going to focus on bone loss that results from loosening. We still need a good history and physical. Basic plain films are, are, are extremely important. And I think now we're using 3D uh, uh, CTs much more often than before. We also want to make sure that we understand whether there's been a previous history of dislocation so that we potentially have uh, constraint liners and or dual mobilities present. Must always have an infection workup, which includes sed rate CRP if they're positive, aspiration is indicated. And again, there are still a lot of metal on metal patients out there. So if there's any suspicion so that you don't get fooled and find abductor destruction, and certain indications, always think of potential metal on metal and don't be afraid to get uh, of serum metal ions. Approach is important. I'm a posterior approach guy. So I think it's the easiest to do major acetabular reconstructions and I can get an extensile approach and do it a classic trochanteric osteotomy if we uh, extended trochanteric osteotomy. Just an example here. This is probably the best descriptive article um, with videos and nice pictures. So again, you want to be able to do an ETO. So what's important is depending on whether it's easy, hard, or much more involved, which would be a type three, we need to know what is our implant choice. And I think today worldwide, there's two implant choices either the use of tantalum cups with augments. Why do I specifically use tantalum? Because it's something that has a 20 year history. No other surface, uh, um, uh, specialized surface has this kind of longevity. And the second choice is a custom triflange. And I think um, that's pretty much where we are. I show these cages on the right. Now I know in places where you know, uh, finances are an issue. Some cages are still used, but I have to be, you know, full disclosure, we have data to show cases, cages just do not work, especially in the more difficult cases. So how do we start out? Well, we start out um, <clears throat> with a simple AP pelvis and complement this with Jude views. We can get a lot of information about what is, is present and what isn't present. And Jude views gives us a good view of the posterior column. As I mentioned earlier, bone defects are come to life 
much more readily when CT models are obtained. Certainly the three D CT scans, especially if you don't do a lot of these cases, it's good to see what is available and are you able to maximize a con your contact to get a stable implant. So how do we do our main, our main assessment? Well, I think the first thing we look at is ischiolysis and the presence of a teardrop. If you see a teardrop, it means that posterior inferior wall is intact. We want to look at migration. If that migration is greater than three centimeters, you have to assume you're going to need more than just a simple large cup fixed with screws. And if it's up and in and Kohler's line is, is, is compromised, that's even more of an involved case. So we'll focus more today on these type threes, uh, which differentiates from type twos. Columns are intact, no support, extra support needed in a type two. And a type three, the up and out defects need secondary support. The up and in defects, until proven otherwise, need some form of primary reconstruction. Uh, and in our case, we use augments. That's what I'm going to show you today, how to these up and in defects, how we can create a hemisphere, which will take a cup. So what's extremely important is the amount of bone that remains. Remember, I originally said, what's the status of the teardrop? The status of a teardrop on the, on the um, AP pelvis tells us the status of this posterior inferior wall. So teardrop, if it's still intact on the x-ray, this will be supportive and enables us to bring the hip center down. The amount of superior migration, if it's up and out, it starts to, uh, if, it, if it's up and out, it starts to destroy some of the posterior wall but it leaves the anterior superior wall intact. If on x-ray you see the migration up and in destroying Kohler's line, if Kohler's line whoop, is destroyed, that means you do not have enough support. That's very critical in determining what you're going to do with respect to reconstruction. So again, are the columns completely supportive? So when you look at this case, even though there's some lysis, posterior infer wall is there and anterior superior, there's some bone loss here, but this tells you that these walls are, columns are supportive and you should have been able to notice that preoperatively on your x-ray as I described. So as we look at an x-ray is a 2D, representation of a 3D structure. And when we look here, teardrops intact, there's little migration. So we only, we can suspect because the migration is less than three that there will be enough support superiorly and anterior superiorly, you will be okay. We really only need a little bit of, of Cancellus graft and uh, and a cup with screws, augments are not indicated. Example here, we see this type two case, little bit of superior bone loss, 13 year follow-up with a cup placed with peripherals, with, with screws. So we know that the this is going to be predictable. So just as we look, just so we can see interoperatively, we look here, there's, the anterior, superior, posterior, inferior. You can see there's some bone. This is just osteophyte, but we're going to have good fixation here and here. So this is your classic type two case. Fortunately, this is the most common kind of a case. And so it doesn't really matter that this is osteophyte because our money is here and here. We're going to put this cup in. We don't really need to bother about this superior bone loss because there is little or no migration and the money is here and here inferiorly. And we always fix these cases with screws. 
every revision regardless. And you can see, we don't care that there's 30% uncovered. Always put screws in. Here's an example case. A little bit of migration, but less than three. A little bit of damage to Kohler's line, but by and large, the migration enables us to get a press fit. But what happens when we do have some damage to Kohler's line, but no superior migration? Again. Teardrop intact, you can see here. And because there's a whole big hole medially, but because the ant, there's no superior migration as well as this type of migration, this is going to be intact. So even though there's, we can ream out into the periphery, get a good peripheral fit, and this is what it looks like. Now, a little more complicated. Now we're starting to get into a gray zone. Some more Kohler's wall is gone. Teardrop still there. But if we think we still have some superior wall, but we don't know for sure until we get in. So we have to be suspicious in a case like this. But we were able to avoid any, we were able to get a press fit. Bring the hip center down, large cup, fixed with multiple screws. But this is kind of the transition period from straightforward to less than straightforward. We have to be suspicious in a case like this, and we would make our final decision intraoperatively. Now, what happens when the migration is greater than three centimeters? The superior dome is not supportive and the shape is oblong. So when you see this X-ray, you translate this into 3D and it's oblong. So we're limited in how much we can ream. Anterior superior wall still intact, why? Because Kohler's line is intact. So you're getting the, the, the picture here that every time you see a plain X-ray, Think of what it look, will look like interoperatively. And then, of course, your report card will be, when you're interoperative, was I right in looking at the x-ray? So again, as we're looking at this non-supportive superior dome. So here's an example. In this particular case, this is a allograph. And now I know, and I know Dr. Sheff will be happy that I show this because if you can't really afford some of these more expensive implants, um, this is this number seven allograph that we published a 25 year dad at work, but it's harder to do. So that's an example. And there is an 18 year follow up. I no longer do that, but if you'll notice, it's harder to get the hip center down. Um, if we look at this, because we don't have the flexibility like we do with metal augments, but I still uh, show it. And in a book that Dr. Sheth and I are publishing, it shows some of these techniques. So what do we do now? Up and out three centimeters. This will be an intracavitary defect that will require a secondary support augment. Um, again, we have bone available, still superior and inferior, but there's too large a defect. This is too large a defect to leave uncovered. So we ream a little bit up into the astabulum superior defect, but it's still there's enough bone left intracavitary so that we can put an augment in, bring our hip center down, put our screws in, and this will be basically a secondary support augment. We had some support initially, but we can't leave 50% uncovered. We will unitize all of these cases with cement. So this is an intraoperative customized implant. We unitize these. So now this we've done this basically in like an intra intraoperative customization. And now there is the implant is not we have extra fixation. There's no way we could get any fixation up in here with the augment. And we put screws in all of these. 
There's a three-year follow-up, and this is a 14-year follow-up on this particular case. Now, when we have larger defects, we still, it's secondary support, but now we flip the augment over. We can't put it inside the cavity because there's not enough support bone. So we flip the augment upside down like so. And again, even though there's a lot of lysis here, we can still see a teardrop. So we'll be able to bring the hip center down. So this is, there's really no bone superiorly to put an augment in here. There's no way we could get the augment stable. So what we do, if you remember in the last picture, we flip the augment 180 degrees and we put it outside. And some of these, the hip center may be slightly higher, but we have our trial in so that we can um, make sure that there's no uh, impedance of, of press fitting the acetabular component. So it's fairly straightforward. We don't use much bone graft now. This is a very old, this is, I probably did this 15 years ago. And so we reverse ream the bone graft and then we put our acetabular component in. And in this particular case, because it's extra cavitary, you put the augment on, you can put the augment on even after you put the cup in, you have a choice. So we've got good fixation, again, unitization. Now what I would do, I would press fit the cup in and screw and squirt cement in from above. But again, we were, this was again, we, something we've been doing for 15 years. Again, liberal use of screws. So there we can see this particular case. We look at this and there's a 10 year follow-up of an extra cavitary augment. Now, when we have even more bone loss and this bone loss goes up uh, very much superior, this is where we use, I showed you that uh, allograft. This is what we call this number seven buttress augment. And this way, the large defect in here, there isn't any bone, can't get any screw fixation. So we get our screw fixation up on the ilium up here, as you can see. Here's an example of a case. This is a patient who um, had a hip done 20 years ago. Notice a gradual leg length issue. This was his x-ray, way superior, but Kohler's line is intact. So the anterior superior column is intact. You can still see a, a, a teardrop. So we brought this hip center way down, no infection. And you can see here, this is a extra cavitary augment here. It's an, and we're able to bring this down, put it outside. So you can bring these extreme cases down to the hip center, which we really couldn't do with these uh, with allografts. So this is sort of a transition from a type 3A, like we transitioned from the 2C into the 3A. This is a transition from a 3A into a 3B. This is a case where we have some lateral bone loss, uh, migration three. Now we've got some a medial bone loss. So this is somewhat of a transition. And this will require a footing augment as well as a X, as well as an intracavitary superior augment, like so. With these larger medial defects, we'll show here, you can see this is an oblong defect. There's a hole medially there. So we put an augment in that functions at function as a footing, and then another augment because we were still too much uncovered. Put the trial in with the trial augments to make sure everything fits. Then we'll unitize it with cement. We'll put cement on the real augments, and then we'll place our cup in. You can see some cement up there. And that's what it looks like here. You can see the footing and then the one augment here and then the augment outside. Our data published in clinical orthopedics um, now uh, uh, over 10 years, we looked at only type 3A defects. And when we looked at our, our, our only 
there was only one ev ev one patient of the 32 that looked like there may be some evidence of, 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 of blue stink, but it never progressed and the patient remained asymptomatic. Um, and so basically we don't have any evidence of radiographic loosening at now beyond 12 years of these type 3A defects. So now we go into the real issues and this is where you have to make a decision. Do I even want to do these particular type of cases? Just for comparative, this reconstruction is completely different from this one. And this is the one where you need to make a decision. First of all, is there a discontinuity? And do you want to reconstruct this with augments or you, do you want to go on to doing a uh, 3D printed custom device? It becomes your choice. I don't believe there's any indication for 3D custom devices in 3As, but the 3Bs, it's dealer's choice. In any event, we have to be able to reconstruct the anterior superior wall, um, whatever is missing and non-supportive. This was cases, these are cases I did over 20, 23, 24 years ago, plates, allograft cages, 50% failure rate. And we published this in clinical orthopedics about somewhere around 20 years ago. Cages broke, they loosened. So in a 3B defect, my advice is you cannot use a cage. I do not think you can, especially if there's a discontinuity. But in any event, we evolved from cages into using these augments. Some augments for 3B defects, this would be an intracavity primary support. This is an intracavity primary support. You can see the augment here supplemented by extra cavitary. And what we most commonly do now is two intracavitary augments. I'm rarely using these cups that are well into the 70s. Most of the cases now to get maximum bone contact is to do, to probably keep most of our cups under 70 millimeters, mostly in the high 60s. So those are the three basic uh, types of defects. Now, how do we reconstruct a 3B defect? Well, you can, this one's, you could suspicion that there's a discontinuity, but there wasn't. So we look here, there's no resemblance in any way of any kind of, of hemisphere. So we need to reconstruct the hemisphere. So we put one augment posteriorly, the right position, fix it with, with screws. And because there's no discontinuity, we're able to fix these with screws because we're not having a, 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 an acetabulum that's separating. So we put one augment in fairly, and now we'll put our trial back in to make sure after we put another, a trial superior in here, Make sure that everything's oriented. We want to put a trial component. And so now you can see we're reducing the size of the cavity, getting our screws in, and now we have recreated a hemisphere. This is, and, and now this is a stable cup. So now, which we had no way of getting stability before. Again, this is an old film. We don't use much graft anymore unitized with cement. And now we're using a revision shell. All 3B defects have a shell that we can drill holes into so we can get these perimeter screws. You cannot, in a cup that has a, uh, an insert, so you can snap an insert in, you cannot drill into the perimeter because you can't get a locking mechanism. And then we can put screws around the perimeter. And again, now these cups are made um, to just cement in, but this tells you how old this is. Cement the cup in. We're locking the screws basically with cement and there's antibiotics in there as well. And there are, as you can see here, we get, um, and there's a one-year post-op. We have consolidation of the bone graft and this is completely healed. So in summary here, 
with respect to just give you an idea here. Always bring the hip center down, intracavitary support and extra cavitary support like so. Just a few examples here. There's a six year follow up. Here's a patient who had a total hip in 2006. You can see migrating up into the pelvis. This was the hardware that we removed. And in this particular case, I screwed both augments together, press fit this medially. Again, there's no discontinuity here. We press fit these medially. And what we do is we screw them together so we can get a press fit. We use the trials to determine which ones to use. In this particular case, I used a dual mobility because of some abductor deficiencies. And then you can see the post-op there again, bringing the hip center down as always. So now in the last few minutes that I have here, I think I'm looking at yeah, another six, five, six minutes. Pelvic discontinuity, most of them are three Bs. Again, cages don't work. Why is chronic bills, why is pelvic discontinuity a problem? Because it's a chronic non-union. Plates and screws do not work. Choice number one, as I mentioned, custom triflange, no cages. There are some fairly good data on custom triflanges. You get a 3D printed model. They don't fix the discontinuity, but these are not easy to put in. Large flanges very often result in some superior gluteal nerve problems, and you always have to modify these. So this is a case that I had here, ended up discontinuity plated. So rather than taking the cup out, I decided to get a 3D printed model. And that's what I did. I just left the cup in. I haven't done a lot of these. I've maybe done six or seven of them, but I use them only for the extreme cases. But if this is something you want to do, then um, it's your choice. Choice number two, and the ones that I do almost always, is the combination of distraction, bone restoration with augments, and or a cup cage. It's an off-the-shelf custom solution. So you can see this defect reconstructed with augments and supplemented with a half cage. This is my go-to implant. We've had several publications. Uh, involved with these particular uh, uh, cases. The last one, Dr. Sheff's been involved in this. So what I've kind of spun this down to is when we have a discontinuity, sort of classified these into surgical technique. The first type is a type one where there's just a jumbo cup only. The type twos, we're redoing a reduction in cup size with using augments to get primary stability. And then the type three, where we use massive medial augments, where we, where we call it the dome technique. And I'm going to show you a video of each. Each of them, re, re, we're using a distraction technique, but the technique is different for each of them. So here's the first one, where type one, where we're gonna use this, a jumbo cup. We have an extraction, a distraction device on, on, and you can see as we separate out, you can see there's motion here. That's the discontinuity, goes right down through into the acetabulum. The distraction device is placed on the ischium and the, and the ilium. So we maximally pull this apart. This has to be a chronic discontinuity where there's fibrous tissue, which you don't want to remove, because if there isn't any fibrous tissue and it's acute, you have to plate it. But those heal. You can see here a little bit of movement. Now we get a little better contact, reverse ream. And now we basically stabilized the discontinuity. There was not enough bone loss, so we didn't need to use an augment. So you can see the fracture has been stabilized. So we'll usually put in a cup that's one or two sizes bigger and we fix it with screws. So there we have that, always put our screws and cement in a liner. 
There's an example of one such case. There, as you can see, the discontinuity here, a large cup, and you can see healing at five years post-op. So this would be a type one treatment of a discontinuity, a type two discontinuity. So this cup was put in elsewhere. This is an 80 millimeter cup. Well, it's still, too, still not big enough and there's a discontinuity. So this is a reduction technique plus distraction plus augments. So here's what, so there's, so this is where we would, put an augment medially, we can fix it, distract it, there's a discontinuity, distract it, and then insert a component, and, and plus or minus a, a cage if you'd like to. Again, notice before the augment, the diameter was 74, with the augment, it's now 64. So let's show a, a case. This was a case that ended up, there was a discontinuity that they missed. You can see how gigantic this uh, uh, defect is, but there's a posterior inferior wall. So what we've done here, we've brought the cup down, to get some contact. Cup is down, we've got a couple of screws in here. There's a superior wall, which you'll see in a minute. And we and now, but we're going to drive in this augment, and this is going to be a, a distraction technique um, where we have the cup stabilized, and now we drive this augment in, and this is another method of performing a distraction. Fix the augment with screws. And now we've stabilized the discontinuity by doing this. There's that, there's that wall that was over here before. We've maximally distracted this out. We would have done this with trial augments to make sure that it was, um, uh, we had the right size. And there's a picture of it. We put more screws in here. And I decided to supplement this. We no longer use full cup cages. The Mayo Clinic has pretty much um, abandoned that. We take a cage. I like a Bergschneider, cut the end off, and then do secondary supplementation. Like so. There's a post-op, and there's a five-year post-op. There's an example of such a case. There's an 11-year follow-up. Another one. There's a five-year follow-up and a nine-year follow-up. Now, finally, our final um, case here, we're just about a half hour. This is a, this is a fantastic video that Dr. Sheff prepared. This is the type three defect, and this kind of, so the type three reconstruction of a discontinuity. And so he demonstrates the discontinuity here. Whoops, oh dear, what happened here? There we go, get it to play. So um, so this was a case Dr. Sheth had obvious discontinuity. And he's assessed it. We're assessing the discontinuity. You can see it here, the pelvis moving independently, two different pieces. Now we go ahead, put augments in place, two different augments, going to basically that put these in place somewhat, and this will help stabilize the discontinuity. Now we ream in reverse over these augments. Again, we call this the dome technique, reaming up to get the correct size. And this is preventing us from falling into the defect. I showed you that in a lesser defect. So he's, re he's reaming up here. Now the reamer is stable rather quite stable, gives us the idea here. So now the augments will be placed in place, just like with the trials. Now the cup can't fall in. Going to put cement in there to unitize this. We always must unitize these particular cases. We're going, the next step is to press fit the cup in place. Again, this was all done with trial 
components. Cup is hit into place here. Again, we've got a good press fit. This isn't just laid in. Distractor is removed. You can see the distractor is removed or the pin that distractor was on. That's the second pin. The distractor pulls against these pins. Checking the cup stability, you can see it's rock solid and then the screws will be placed in. These, this is, these are, this is stable um, just by using the augments and the, and the cup. And now the liner will be cemented in place. Again, we use a revision shell in every one of these particular cases. And most of these now we're cementing in uh, a, a dual mobility. Because I think it's a lot of these have instability issues. And we can see here the cup and the augments. So I like to brace these pieces. People, just make sure to curtail the activity. I do partial weight bearing for um, almost three months. And then we have to we convince them that this may be the last uh, shot at this. So in conclusion, cages and allographs are no longer recommended for these kind of 3B cases. Trebecker metal cups with augments, plus or minus a half cage with or without distraction almost always distraction, or a tri-flange cup um, as is your other choice. So thank you very much for your attention. I think we went for about 35 minutes. I think we're on time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Prof, you can stop sharing, actually. Okay, let me hang on. Let me do that. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor, for this very enlightening presentation. A lot of people all over the world are looking to see you and listen to you. So this is a very great opportunity for all of them. Well, thank uh, you for the remarks. I enjoyed it. Uh, Prof, just a couple of questions before we go to Neil's presentation. Uh, Prof, what do you think is the role for impaction bone grafting in today's practice? So um, obviously, as you, I'm sure you know, it's, uh, not very popular at all in the United States. But in Canada, Dr. Gross has done some impaction graphing using augments with it. Also in Exeter, I know that, um, that Graham Gee had started before he uh, retired. And I know John Temperley, I'm not even sure he may have retired now. <laughs> they were doing some uh, where you would do impaction grafting after you put the augments in. Uh, I don't, they showed some data. There's virtually no impaction grafting done in the United States and rarely on the femoral side. But the results out of the UK, but not for discontinuity. I remember Graham Gee and Temperley said the results were not good using the mesh and those things in, in, the, in the discontinuities with bad three Bs. The Nijmegen data is very good, um, but it's just something we have little or no experience. I did about 25 impaction grafting femurs. They did well, but since the advent of the tapered stems, I don't think the femurs are done very often. Thank you very much, Professor. Prof, in the last 20 years, there were a lot of cases where metal and metal hip replacements were done, right? So what kind of osteolysis? I mean, do you still see those cases? Are you revising some of this because of the issues? So um, most of the metal on metal, the there's two kinds of metal on metal. Um, the metal on metal done in, in Germany and Switzerland with small heads, where the metal device was cement was fixed into plastic, that seemed to be okay. The metal on metal where you had um, big, uh, uh, big head total hips and surface replacements. The big head total hips are pretty much all gone. The patient, those have been revised for the most part. That was a bad, bad thing. However, the surface replacements 
in cases like the Birmingham and maybe the, the uh, uh, there were several bad designs, but Birmingham cases that were done well in males, not females, uh, there's still a lot of those around. So a lot of those have not been revised. The metal on metal service replacements that have been revised are the ones done poorly. The big head THA metal on metals, the bigger problem was the trunnionosis and cobalt release from the, from the big head on the trunnion as opposed to chromium release from the articulating surface. But in the States, they're pretty much gone. They've all been, they've all failed and have been revised. Thank you very much, Professor. Prof, we'll start with uh, Neil's presentation. Uh, Neil, can you unmute and switch on your video, please? Yep. All right, let me share my screen here. Hitesh, can you see my screen? Yeah, very much, yes. uh, Neil, and full screen, please. Yeah, full right. screen. Yep. Settings. Yes? We have the, yeah, this is perfect. Okay, great. And Wayne, you can see these cases? Yes. Great. So, uh, I mean, it's a great talk. I mean, I've heard a version of, uh, of Dr. Poprosky's talk several times over the last decade, and I always learn something from them. I mean, such a vast experience on how to think about these defects. And, you know, I think some of the concepts that he talks about over, over time have become really mainstream on how to think about these. And, and the key, I think, Wayne, and tell me if you think I'm wrong, but is to really think about this before you get in the operating room, right? So you've got a plan in place. You have the ability to fine tune your plan intraoperatively, but the, the thing you want to avoid is not seeing something beforehand and getting in there and being surprised and say, well, now I don't know what to do. A absolutely. That was probably the most important message. That that's why we say easy, hard, refer it or forget it. And, uh, and <laughs> I, I think that that is so, so critical because then you can, you, you can, match what you've the you you thought of preoperatively intraoperatively but it just is i just can't emphasize that more and you whatever it takes if you understand the x-rays like those of us who do a lot of these probably don't need cts but with otherwise just get a ct scan so you see the thing before you go in there yeah great so Hitesh, we've got about two or three cases we'll take about maybe 10 15 minutes just to bring about some concepts uh, I think that Dr. Poprosky has mentioned, and we're going to try to summarize some of the things that he's gone over. Um, these are my disclosures, which are not pertinent to this uh, presentation. These are just, again, cases. Uh, these are my cases that I have taken care of. And so, Wayne, first case, 63-year-old lady, right total hip 16 years ago, comes in and complains that her right lower extremity over time has slowly gotten shorter and shorter and she's starting to have pretty significant amounts of groin pain uh, where she's unable to ambulate. So she comes in with a uh, wheelchair. Um, what do you see here? What do you think is a big concern to you before uh, treating this patient? Yeah, so the first thing you have to see here is for this to have gone, yeah, you're borderline, you're up and in, you're borderline three centimeters, maybe slightly shy, but anytime, even if this is, if you measured this and it was in the type 2C realm, you still have to think, A, is there a possibility that this is a discontinuity? It said 16 years ago, so if it was a, if it is a discontinuity, it's chronic. The second thing I see here is I see a teardrop so I'm going to bring this hip center down. And um, I, in order to do that, um, I'm going to make sure that I have augments available in case I need to supplement this. I believe I can get this stable without, for the most part, I think I can, um, if there is a discontinuity, I think I can get this um, uh, stable 
with with an augment and the augment may or may not need to be supportive because we're right at the borderline here between a bad a type 2c and a potential three you got to be prepared for either but you might be able to just get this reconstructed uh potentially without an augment but this is where you have to think of three different potentials dealing with a discontinuity with distraction uh, how am I going to get a, a large cup in, get the hip center down, and the use of augments? Those are the three things, everything that you have to be able to see when you look at this x-ray. Yeah, they're really, really important points. And again, I think, you know, for the uh, participants on the on the, uh, on the Zoom virtual meeting, you know, I think always additional workup. And, you know, Dr. Bukowski mentioned this in his talk in the, as a first uh, couple of slides. Every one of these revisions has got to get uh, lab work up to make sure there's no infection. If inflammatory markers are elevated, that should prompt you to get an aspiration. So, you know, question, Wayne, are you, you know, again, having trained with you, I'm, I'm of your school of thought. I don't typically get a CT scan on any of these cases because for me, it's not going to change my management. Intraoperatively, I could change my plan accordingly, even if there is a discontinuity. It's just a matter of being prepared. But the CT scan is not going to really help me make up my mind one way or another. Do you think for people who are starting out or maybe have a little less experience early on who are going to tackle some of these cases should get a CT scan to start? Yeah, mandatory for that kind of yeah. pre that kind of surgeon. Yes. Yeah. And again, I think it's just a better chance for you to really classify the defect and to really come up with a good preoperative plan. So I'll tell you for this patient, <clears throat> center rate CRP were normal. Other uh, markers of sort of making sure they've got the good ability to heal and be able to not have a wound healing issue postoperatively, all normal for this lady. Surgical planning. So I know, uh, again, your approach, uh, Wayne, is always going to be a posterior approach as it is for me. Again, we talked about chronic pelvic discontinuity. Um, if you were confident that there was no discontinuity, would your approach change? And if intraoperatively you encountered a discontinuity, does your approach change other than adding distraction technique? Uh, so if I'm going to, if it's, if there's a discontinuity uh, and you distract you distract five, six millimeters um, because there's not a huge amount of bone loss. Um, uh, I, I think the, I think either way, you're going to, for all likelihood, have to use an augment. The question is, is the augment going to be needed for primary support or secondary support? That's, um, that's where we are here. Now, you also, this medial defect, so if you look at this <clears throat> x-ray on the right, um, this defect might be larger than you think. I always find that some of these medial defects, anterior superior medial defects, they're, they're bigger when you get in there. And so you have, to be, you have to be prepared to potentially use dome augments and or uh, augments to do uh, uh, the primary or secondary stability. So you have to be from, you have to be familiar. Once you get into this kind of case, you've got to really know how to use these augments. Yeah. And I think what's, what you're really talking about is I think for any surgeon who's using augments, it's important to understand that your augment has a function. You've heard Dr. Poprosky kind of say a couple of times now, whether the augment is there for primary stability or supplemental fixation. And again, I think it's important to understand that your augments are not there just as bone void fillers. Oh, there's no bone, let me just put an augment there. The augments can actually perform a function for you with regards to your reconstruction. So, Wayne, well, I got an important question, I think, which is pertinent to a lot of the people who are probably on this webinar. And, and this is sort of why I chose this case. This is a small stature female. She's five foot one, 140 pounds, okay? And I think one of the issues they have in India specifically is a lot of their patients are very small. Small pelvis, you're looking at tiny cups in the range of 42 to 46 max. 
Uh, and now you've got this defect, so you're going to have some bone loss, and the cup's going to be bigger potentially. Um, any special considerations when you're thinking about some of these smaller stature females, which even in the U.S., these are the people that come in with a discontinuity? Um, well, I, I think that with these people, this is probably these people where you're going to be more, more prone to use intracavitary augments to keep and use the smaller diameter cups because if you know trying to put a large diameter cup without augments and a smaller small these smaller people i think it, it would be be more of an issue and i know in some of these uh, females in the past these little dysplastics and that you know we had a lot of a lot of cup exposed and uh, um some of these people had, had, you know, some some symptoms. So that's where uh, where I would I would go with these, trying to keep the cups, you know, small. Keep them. Uh, it's obviously not going to be like it's going to be somewhat bigger than the primary, but keep these cups in and around um, in and around fifty. On the other hand, you know, you you have to in these people for stability, so you don't have to use twenty eight heads. You may these are probably people that you want to use uh, dual mobility in to because you don't have the ability to put a 40 cup in yeah no i think really important right i think especially with these cases where you're worried about instability dual mobility is a definite nice adjunct i think you do run into some trouble with these really small cups um but again i think with intracavitary reduction reducing the size of the defect and the size the size of the um actual like hemisphere that you're dealing with Still getting a cup to that 48, 50, 52 range will at least allow you to be able to use a dual mobility for most systems and again be able to enhance your stability. So I'll show you what I did. This is the immediate pack you x ray. And just like you said, Wayne, this was a much bigger defect than we, we thought it was going to be. Uh, we ended up using a dome augment. So these are two 50 by 10 millimeter augments put together uh, and basically se secured into the medial aspect or antero superior medial aspect of the. Uh, Acetabulum, again, these are not fixated with screws. Uh, so this is really hinging on the superior pubic ramus and the ilium. Uh, there was cement used to unitize that with the cup. This is a size 54 cup. Uh, and then you've got another additional augment here that's unitized to the cup with supplemental fixation. Now I'll show you this lady, unfortunately three weeks post-operatively she fell in her bathroom with a twisting uh, injury to the right lower extremity. And she, she had a long spiral, uh, two to three centimeters distal to her stem. But I was very surprised to hear when I got this phone call from the resident that she had fallen and she had a fracture. I was like, oh my God, this is gonna be a disaster. You can see her actual reconstruction on the socket and she didn't change. So even with that type of a fall, she was able to maintain uh, the position of her implants and that dome did not go all the way into her socket or into, her, um, into the true pelvis. And I'll tell you, she's now a little over four years out and actually pretty pretty happy and very highly functional back to doing what she's doing. I think the, overall, the, the x-rays haven't changed at all, which is great. Any comments on the reconstruction, Wayne? No, uh, that's exactly, like I said, you've got to be prepared to use the three different types of augment reconstruction, the dome reconstruction, intracavitary primary support, and extra cavitary in these in these um, kind of defects. And again, uh, you described uh, exactly right. You want to press fit these these uh, these dome augments in, um, and uh, you you you're able, once you you do that, they're not going to go into the pelvis. But you just have to take your time, and 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 it's better to make them a little bigger than you need to than a little smaller. Yeah. And I think the other thing that the dome really helps you with is, I think, restoring your hip center, right? The hip center, the tendency is to always put the hip center up and in because that's where the defect is and there's missing bone. And so anything that can help drop your hip center down and keep you lateralized to restore the native hip center is going to be better for the overall biomechanics, I think, of the construct and of your total hip. Yeah, bringing the hip center down, you know, even if it's up, you know, seven, eight millimeters, your hip's not going to be as stable. You will not restore the offset. That's huge. That's that's well, that's my main motivation for bringing it down. Yeah. 
All righty, let's go to another case quickly. A post-op protocol that we talked about, uh, I brought this up just because, again, I think, you know, the post-op protocol for me, for this patient, the same as yours, right? Touchdown weight bearing for at least six to 10 weeks, and then you put them to 50% weight bearing for a few more weeks, and it's a good three months before you're letting them weight bear. And for me, I'd, I'd like to get at least three consecutive x-rays that show me no change in component position before we let them start fully weight bearing. Uh, but the second case here, so this is a is probably one of the toughest cases I've had to deal with. Um, 71 year old lady, right? Told her 21 years ago, and actually came to see uh, one of my partners. And you know, at this time, they got some inflammatory markers. They were negative, no no suspicion for infection. You can see this defect. Right? I mean, there's a huge gaping hole. I think there's no question um, for whether there's a discontinuity and. You know, I'll just review quickly for the participants on the uh, participants on the webinar. When you're looking at an X-ray, you know the Mayo Clinic guys have actually come up with a nice way to how to quantify or at least quantify the chance that you have a discontinuity. But if you have a medial breach, which we do, if you have inf uh, medial migration of the inferior segment, which we do, and you've got asymmetry of the obturator foramen, and if you add a lateral X-ray to this, like a Jude view or a cross table lateral. Basically, you can get a 100% chance of being able to identify a discontinuity. So I would tell you in this case, there's a 100% chance you're going to encounter discontinuity. So, Wayne, one question I have for you is, how do you differentiate this as an acute discontinuity versus chronic? Is there anything in the x-ray that tells you one over the other? Um, this is such an odd-looking x-ray to me. This is something that the bone was poor quality. And this, I would lean towards this, even though it says 21 years ago, I might be suspicious mm -hmm. that this could be acute. There's nothing other than the fact that this, this, this does not look like a chronic discontinuity just by the bone pattern. I mean, it certainly can be wrong, um, but... Um, I would get more of a try, no history of trauma. I would really go after a history uh, uh, of this particular person. Look at other views. And this is one I'd probably get a CT scan. Yeah, really, really important concepts. I think real, real important point, right? I mean, really listen to her history. So my partner thought this was an acute pelvic discontinuity. Talked to one of our trauma partners and actually got him to help him with this case. And when I, and, and then I inherited this patient sort of after the first reconstruction, but when talking to her at that point, sounds like she had progressive pain, progressive shortening of the limb over time. So this was not an acute fall or an acute episode that occurred where all of a sudden she had, you know, hip pain. Um, but I'll tell you that intraoperatively, this is what I kind of inherited. Um, and you can see that the, the cup was placed in a position with a pretty high hip center. So this kind of dovetails into what we were just talking about, trying to restore your hip center. So that you can see the plate was put on in the posterior column. And I'll tell you, our trauma partner is extremely like gifted on, on being able to reduce these fractures. I don't think there's any reduction at all of that discontinuity or of that acute fracture, which when I looked at this x-ray the first time, I said, that tells me that this is probably more of an acute on chronic situation as opposed yeah. to a few full acute uh, episode. Um, so I think the hip center was placed pretty high. And as a result, they ran into some instability issues. So they removed her stem. And unfortunately, in the removal of the stem, they fractured the femur. And uh, so this was a really complicated case and was a pretty big uh, surgery for this patient. But um, I was then asked to see if I can see this lady in follow-up. And this is her two-week x-ray, which at this point, start noticing the bottom screw starting to pull out a little bit. And at three weeks post-op, when she actually eventually came to see me, that bottom screw and the plate have already pulled off the bone. Um, so I I'm not going to belabor this. I mean, the lab work up and additional testing imaging. Again, I think a CT scan would be helpful. I did have a CT scan from the initial surgery, so I didn't get another one. Again, lab work values were normal, and they had normalized within three weeks, which is great, but I got an aspiration on this patient just because of her history, and she had recent surgery. I had a seven-hour procedure on this reconstruction, and thankfully, her differential and white blood cell count were very low, and she did not have any growth uh, over five days for her culture. So 
question for you, Wayne, is really what is your treatment option here? And are you going to revise both the acetabulum and the femoral component? Just the acetabulum. And what do you do with the hardware with the plate? Do you remove it? Do you keep it in place? Do you pre-plate it? A complicated case. Yeah, so I mean, the first thing is you need to take out that the the, uh, the top. Um, you need to take out the modular portion of the of the of the femur that has to go, and um, it looks like you might. That looks like that's a fairly long neck. So I would check with the system and see if I had the a, the shortest possible um, body. He had to do that because he, the hip center was high, um, and. Uh, so I would just, you know, get rid get rid of the, the top parts, and I would I would work on bringing the hip center hip center down. You have to assess the discontinuity. Obviously, the plate hasn't worked. Um, plate probably going to be in the way. I mean, it's loose, so I think plate has to come out. Those screws have backed out. It hasn't been that long. Yeah. I take the plate out and see if the patient was a uh, a, a candidate. Um, for a distraction. I mean, the other side of the coin is you can basically say, you know what, this is, um, look at the CT, get a 3D model in this, potentially something you might consider a, uh, um, a custom device. But even that, with the, with, the, with the fact that someone's already been in there, they've tried to plate it, um, that's not a chip shot. I would want to have a 3D model. I would want, in this case, a 3D model in my hand. I would, I would get one of those made, pay the thousand dollars, and look at the model and see what I had. That's what I would do. Yeah, completely reasonable. I know, and Hitesh, I know that in India there's capabilities of actually doing 3D printing and getting models made fairly cheap, right? Which is actually kind of nice as an adjunct to again sort of play the game before you get to the game. You can look and really do a good preoperative plan. Um, so I agree with all of those things. You know, I actually thought about doing a tri or some custom device for this. The only problem was that this patient was in so much pain and she was in a rehab facility three weeks after surgery that they couldn't even transfer her from her bed uh, to the commode without so much pain because she had still had severe or significant motion uh, in her pelvis every time she was moving. So I can tell, I can show you what we did. Um, and so this is an intraoperative fluoro uh, image. And so I did exactly what you said. I went to take out the proximal body of the stem. And in that time of trying to take it out, the stem was grossly loose and it was actually oh. undersized. So the whole you stem- really got lucky. You got lucky. Yeah, I definitely got lucky. I mean, this was two and a half, three weeks old. So I was happy with that, but- Basically, what we did is I used an augment up top intro superiorly and kind of unitized the bottom portion of the fractured piece and the piece that was up top here. So it was almost like a three part discontinuity, which I hadn't seen. I mean, it was un un completely unstable, but there was a huge stripe of scar tissue. So that made me think that this was definitely a chronic picture and had happened over time. Uh, we put the cup in. You can see we were able to get some really nice inferior screws into the superior pubic ramus, even the little guy down here into the ischia. But that allowed me to get some good inferior fixation to prevent abduction failure. And then we use some additional augments here. There's one here that unitized across the ilium uh, and kind of put this all in one place. And then we use cement in between. And we upsized the stem from a size 15 stem to a size 18 stem only by removing that first screw and putting back a unicordable screw, the rest of the screws we were able to bypass. And I can show you, she's a two years out from this now. Mm. And you can kind of see, we were able to put some cement here to unitize the augments together to the cup, but she's been able to actually ambulate now with a cane, uh, walk her a cane, depending on where she is with very little pain. Uh, but I think those augments were able to allow me to really kind of bridge a lot of this gap because yeah, this was a very, very unique and rare sort of discontinuity pattern, which I had not seen before. Yeah, so you, the, the, it looks like a great x-ray. The most important point you really brought up, and I think these people who are tri-flange custom people, 
there's a lot of these people can't wait six, eight, 10 weeks for this particular, for this to be taken care of. And then after two months, well, it's not quite right. Well, they have to work on it again. And so um, uh, that that's one of those, uh, one, one of those I issues. And that's why I think if you, those people who just want to do tri flanges on everybody, there are going to be times when you need to be able to think on your feet. Yeah, it looks like uh, um, hip center down two years. I would say this is not going to fail. If you've been like this at two years, I see no no other issues. And um, here, yeah, great job. Yeah, it was a tougher case. Um, and I'm, I'm happy that we changed the stem also because, I, again, we were able to get a better fit. And you can see even the on the AP pelvis or AP hip x-ray, they can see the splines have really engaged. Uh, with her cortex, and I think that was the right size. Hitesh, do we have two minutes for the last quick case? Of course. Okay. So, Wayne, again, this is a case that I think for the post-op protocol for this lady, I kept her non-weight-bearing slash touchdown for a longer period of time. Because if this fails, we've got a huge hole in her pelvis, and I'm not sure what other option I would have at that point other than a tri yeah. and She wasn't interested in any more surgery. So, um Wait, this is a case that you know of. This is a case I recently did, Hitesh, on a 33-year-old, uh, sorry, 63-year-old guy who had a hip done 32 years ago. He was supposed to come see me prior to the pandemic and then kind of got lost over a couple of years. And then he showed up again because he now started having squeaking in his hip. So I was concerned that he is now basically worn through this plastic and is, is rubbing metal on metal as an articulation. But I'll tell you that you know, my concern was that all of this bone was going to be gone, right? Once you take the implant out and you do a debridement, and I'll tell you that the cup fell out, the screws came out pretty easily, barely any force on the cup and the cup fell out. And there was, this was just a ton of osteolysis. That, that, looks, like, that, was, that looks like plasma spray cup. Yep. Yeah, those, it was. You know, a lot of those fell out. Yeah. Exactly. So um, same kind of thought with regards to the workup. I did not get a CT scan on this because I was also concerned that once I get in there and actually do the debridement, that my bone loss pattern was going to look different than what I saw on the CT scan. So wait, I got a question like with regards to, I don't think it's a discontinuity issue really, but two main questions for you here. If you're a tri-flange or even a cup cage enthusiast, what do you do when you have a pre-operatively made custom device and then you go and you do the debridement and your device doesn't fit according to what your plan was because some of the things that looked like bone on the CT scan are actually soft tissue? Yeah, so I know there are some that people, Hollis Potter and others from, from special surgery say, oh no, we have these CTs and MRIs. We can we can get it down to, we can see molecules. I agree with you. I don't think so. A CT on this, a, a tri-flange for this with that ischiolysis and, and, and pubic lysis, I don't, I think it'd be really tough to get a tri-flange there. This is one where you would, you know, where I, I think, you know, would augment, do an augment reconstruction like you did last time. I agree completely with you. Um, and I'll, I'm just, in, for an interest of time, I'll show you what we did. I mean, this was a, probably one of the largest defects that I've actually encountered. And we kind of did a dome technique, but did the dome inferiorly as opposed to sort of antro superiorly. Yeah. And again, we've got the augment. And Wayne, I know you know this case because I sent this case to you the day that I did it. Um, yep. And you've got yep. two augments here that are the thickest. This is These are 56 by 18 millimeter, like, or a 24 millimeter thick augment. So it's almost like a small 48 millimeter cup. And this augment was basically hinged again between the superior ilium here and the residual pubic ramus. You can see there's no yep. ramus. No. Uh, and then we were able to put a cup in. We put in a dual mobility liner at a different angle. Uh, and we put another augment up here for supplemental fixation. And thankfully, this guy is only 18 weeks out. So he's, he's early. He's barely over four months out. I just let him go back to weight bearing as tolerated. He's got very little pain. Uh, I'm hoping that this has at least captured some areas 
of egg growth in these three spots here. And then you've got a whole bunch of surface area contact back here with another augment posterior superiorly for supplemental fixation. But again, another challenging, challenging case, not a discontinuity issue, but I think the bone loss pattern was very different once we did the debridement yeah. appropriately. Uh, and we had to figure out how to deal with the defect once we saw it. Yeah, the only what they what well they have done a few at Mayo Clinic is kind of just ignored everything and fearly put a couple of those uh, buttress augments up about get a little bit of contact with the superior bone and just let them fly and see what happens. I prefer this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, great. Uh, great, great case. Too. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Tash, thank you so much yeah, for the yeah. opportunity for us to be uh, to be involved with this. This was a great discussion, and uh, hopefully this was helpful for our participants. Neil, can we take uh, one or two questions? Yeah, of course. Yeah, Neil, you mentioned that, yeah, you can stop sharing, actually, Neil. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, uh, thank you for those wonderful cases. And Neil, when you mentioned uh, in the last case, that you go in with a plan and inside you see that there's a lot more osteolysis. Do you think some of these augments can reshape from the back, back side of the table or use an allograft composite? So I think that you can, uh, you can cut some of these porous foam metal augments on the back table if you need to change the shape. Again, I don't have any experience with allograft, and that's just because I'm probably a little bit later to uh, to training. And I know that Wayne has seen a lot of this in his earlier part of the career, and I know that from definitely for the surgeons in India are much more skilled at using allograft and shaping that. I think you can use allograft. I think the key thing with osteolysis is you have to clear out the membrane and remove uh, the debris that is within the osteolytic defect. If you remove the wear generator, which in this gentleman's case was the polyethylene liner and potentially the metal cup, which has now had some wear from the metal uh, ball head, removing the metal, uh, removing the wear generator will allow those osteolytic defects to reconstitute on their own if you've cleared them out. Um, I don't know if allograft I think would be fine, but I think we do know that the data on allograft is that as you get to that 10 year mark, you see some resorption of that allograft. The nice thing with the augment is the augment is not gonna resorb. And most of the times that this incorporates so well that if you ever had to go back in and take out an augment, you're gonna destroy half the pelvis to get it out. So I'd love for that to just ingrow and sit where it's gonna sit and that just becomes part of his bone. And if for some point something loosens up later, like his cup, I have at least another I have an augment base that I can work off of to recreate, to re, uh, revise the acetabular component. Thank you, Neil. And uh, Prof. Uh, Paproski, when do you, uh, how often do you get an angiogram when you do some of these revision? Uh, for example, you expect an external idea erosion? Yeah, so I, I'll get an idea. If there's a, if I think if the screws are, if any screws intrapelvic, I will make sure. We'll do sometimes you'll do urological studies. Yeah, I'm I go after that very quick. But for if, if there aren't any screws, I'm not too nervous. But screws in the pelvis, you gotta have a, you gotta really look at it. And then even if you're gonna go after it, you have to have a general surgeon or vascular surgeon with you. Thank you, Professor. Uh Neil, I think that's all the questions that we have. Uh thank great. you, Prof. Yeah, it was a fantastic talk and such wonderful cases. Uh, it's great learning experience with you guys. Thank you so much for joining in. Okay, you're welcome. All right, very good. Thank you Next for having us. Thank you so much, Dr. Bye -bye. P. Great to see you. Right, and uh, see I'll you. catch up with you soon. Okay, you. Bye -bye. all right. Bye -bye. Take care, guys. All right.